All right. If you ever have too much time, that's pretty much what happened just now. Where you look at the clock and you're like, oh, I got an hour. And then you end up almost late because you thought you had more time than you did, I guess. We are in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. So I. Um, You said Revelation 1? I'd widened it out because he wanders around. I'd widened it out because he wanders around. Um, he made it known by sending his, his angel to the servant John. So it is the revelation of Jesus. Uh, Dan is here to, uh, Danny's here to uh, run the job for Ryan. The brothers are looking out for me. So it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. God gave it to his servant, through an angel, to his servant John. Uh, and John bore witness to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. And we commented on this, that remember John was the only one to see the actual death of Christ, the only apostle to see the death of Christ. Blessed is the one who, who reads aloud this word of words of prophecy. We talked about how, um, how, yeah. Sour Pat Tom? What? Sour Pat Tom? I think so. Gun sugar? Okay. Or is the battery dead? It's on now. It says it's live. Was it on during service? Interesting. I'm not going to repeat everything. So, blessed is the <laughs> blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Blessed are those that uh, hear these words, guard them. The time is near. Just keep it for now, son. Put it in my bag. In my bag. See my bag. I'm not going to move now because moving makes it click. <laughs> um, blessed are those who hear, who keep the words written here. And we didn't, we, we didn't translate that as obey. We tra translated that as guard for the time is near. Okay, Verse 4. Now we're getting to the new stuff. Verse 4. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who was and is and is to come. Seven spirits who are before his throne. Uh, the, one who, the one who is and was and is to come. That's the Father. From the seven spirits who are before his throne. Seven is a God number, so we have a God spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. And from Jesus Christ, the martyr. The faithful. The firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. He is the witness He is the Christ first, that's the anointed one. The faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. So he is the Christ, which means he's the one who suffers for your sins and is raised for your justification. He is the faithful. He is the witness. I like to translate the martyr as the martyr, as is he's the one who gave his life for you. Um, you can also trans translate it as the witness. He witnesses God's love for you. Um, you look at him and you see the love of God in Christ Jesus. I'll take that too. 
uh, the faithful. He is faithful even when you're not faithful. He is known as the faithful. And if you ever, 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 ever think to yourself, and I do this all the time, that you don't have enough faith to convince God that you have faith, which is a wrong way of looking at faith. That's a worse way of looking at faith. But, but I mean, it, I, and, I, and I think this a lot, um, and then I have to repent of it, but um, faith is not the stuff that you have to, so instead of doing a bunch of works for God to merit favor with God, now all you have to do is have faith. Well, now with that one thing, it's easy to think, well, okay, I need to have enough faith or I need to have faith enough that God believes that I have faith. You know what I mean? So now instead of conning him with all my works, like a kid cons their parents that they actually are good for goodness sake, you're, you're folding your hands to show how, how much faith you actually have and thus you know, manipulating God into believing that you actually believe. Um, when that sort of talk comes into your mind, uh, or when those, it, it's doubt. It's doubt. It's, your, it's, your, it's the doubt and despair that you don't have enough of whatever it is for God to love you. And the answer to that is, I don't, but Jesus is the faithful. You follow me? Where my faith lacks, he is the faith. So where I am... Me and you, microphone. We're going to have words. Oh, 12 is ready. So, um, when, when you sort of think this through, this is just doubt. We don't have enough works, whatever the works are. We lack the works that are necessary for us to. How many of these do I break in a week? Enough? Three a month. About three a month? Thank you. Or less. When I'm up here, it's full action, uh, full contact worship. I broke a mass today. You know, that's preaching with oomph. <laughs> Eight minutes of oomph. I was just joking around today. I, 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 shorter, I believe in shorter sermons because, one, um, the attention span of people is smaller than it used to be. So Luther could say something like, the sermon was the longest, was the, was, was the most important hour and a half to two hours of the week. Um, I don't think Danny Hutchinson can make it through a two-hour sermon. I just don't believe that he can't. No, no. Um, but also, there's so much in the liturgy that I don't want um, a stumbling block. You follow me? So I don't want y'all stumbling out of here an hour and a half or two hours after, you know what I mean? On a high feast day like Good Friday, I'm okay to let it roll. But on like, on like the ninth Sunday of Trinity, for me personally, with the generation that we have, I think that, that shorter and crisper is better. That's just a personal opinion of mine. Um, Amy worked really hard on shortening the sermons because of Sophia. I would come out of church and it would have been a good 15 minute sermon. I was like, wasn't that great? I didn't hear a word of it. I was handling your children. And so I whittled it down to 10 minutes. Wasn't that great? I got the first part, I got the last part, but in the middle it was the, your children. And so we, we tried to find a place where mothers who had like children, we could, you know what I mean? Um, but anyway, that's a, that's a shop talk for another time, huh? Oh, no, no, no. No, no, no. Our, our congregation's like, more, more. You know, um, the fact that there's a digital clock up there that only I can see, that's just, you know, why is it up there? Therefore, more word. The fact that it's digital so I can't make, make, make a mistake, it almost glows. No, more word. Only a little sarcasm here. Oh, no, we're good. It's a good question. Um, to him who loves us and freed us with, from our, our sins by his blood. And this is when the new stuff starts. He loved us and he freed us with his blood from our sins. You should take that in and be comforted by it. Jesus is the faithful. Where you don't believe, he has faith for you. He is the witness. Where your witness fails, his witness does not fail. He is the firstborn from the dead, which means the way he is and the way he raises from the dead, you will too. The ruler of the kings of the earth, as Terry pointed out last week, if he rules, then we'll rule too. 
There's that strange verse where he's like, I've made you a bunch of kings. And the disciples are like, we're on board with that. But your regular Christian, me, I'm like, I don't want to rule anything. I just want to receive from you, God. Um, ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us by, from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom of priests to the, his God and Father. You are a kingdom of royal priests. There are no priests in the New Testament because he has you. You are priests to others. You serve God by loving your neighbor. That's what a priest does. A priest serves God. And so you serve God by loving your neighbor. You offer your lives as living sacrifices to God, holy and pleasing in His sight. To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever, and you say, Amen. there you go. All right, verse 7, definitely new stuff now. Hold everything. I want to make sure that Dan Hutchinson gets new stuff. Behold, He is coming with the clouds. Now I want you to hold that for a second. What does that mean, He is coming with the clouds? Who comes with the clouds? Sorry? Well, Jesus comes with the clouds because he says he comes with the clouds, but who comes with the clouds? I'm sorry? God does. Daniel 5 and Daniel 7. The Son of Man comes in the clouds of heaven. And this is important because every time you hear Son of Man, besides thinking of Tarzan, the Disney event, Son of Man, never mind. Um, Son of Man is not, oh, look. Jesus is making reference to his humanity. He's a son of man. No. Son of man is the biggest God signal in the Gospels. When Jesus calls himself the son of man, he says, he's saying, that Daniel 7 stuff, that's me. That Daniel 5 stuff, that's me. This is Daniel 7. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow. His hair was, and the head was like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. My love's like a burning flame. No, his wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued forth and came out before thousands of thousands attended him. Ten thousand times, ten thousand stood before him. The courts sat in judgment. The books were opened. And so Daniel sees this day where everyone is standing before the throne. And there the Ancient of Days is seated on the throne. White wool hair, uh, clothes as white as snow. Fire issuing from the throne. Wheels burning with flames. And just when you think, oh no. Oh, no. I looked because of the great sound of the horn. We'll get to that. The beast was killed, and I, and I, and I, I saw its body destroyed and burned with fire. We'll get to that. As for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away. Blah, blah, blah. We'll get to that, too. Verse 13, Daniel 7. In, I saw in the night visions, behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the Son of Man. And so you have this thing. Where God is doing business, the court is about to be in session. This is not the people's court. This is not Judge Judy. This is God. And he's about to lay the smack down on sinners. And then, coming in the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man. So don't think to yourself when you hear the Gospels, Jesus goes, the son of man does this, the son of man does that. Oh, look, you're identifying with us as a man. No. No. He's identifying with God. He's this God who comes in the clouds of heaven. Remember, this comes up at his, at his trial where he could have gotten off the hook, where, where the false witnesses, none of them could make the glove fit. Okay? They were all false witnesses. And so they say, well, what do you say for yourself to all these witnesses? And all he has to do is be silent, and everything's going to be okay. But instead... Not heeding the, the advice of his counsel, he says, you will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. And they tear their robes because he just said, I'm God. 
and you're going to see me coming in the clouds of heaven. And that's when they're like, this is, this is the uh, few good men moment where Jack Nicholson says that he did order the code red. I mean, uh, this is that moment where, where like everybody freezes because they can't believe that he just admitted that he's guilty. That's it. That's it. Behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. He came up to the Ancient of Days, and he's presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom and all peoples and nations and languages would serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom is one that shall never be destroyed. And this is important too. Because Daniel's reaction to this is not, it's good Lord to be here. Anyone who says that they're going to engage the living God with a beer in their hand and an LSU game on in the background in their garage is deceiving themselves. And, and I've, usually it's the spouses of, of, of members who don't go to church when I visit them, and they're like, look, I just would like to, you know, I talk to God in my kitchen I have my engagement with God in my garage. Have you ever heard this before? Me and the nature, outside of nature, I engage God. I don't have to come to church. And, and usually I just sort of nod, but sometimes if I'm feeling squirrely, I will say something like, you engage God in your garage? Yes. Can you show me this garage? Well, it's, you just saw it. Well, look, the problem is that if you engage the living God, what's going to happen to the garage? going to blow up and destroy. God is not this person that you can walk up at a social gathering with your drink and go, you know, I heard about you, God. You're a great God. It's cool the way you do the things you do. No. Look at, look at, uh, look at my uh, buddy Mark Stevens working overtime to make sure that you get Daniel 7. Look at that. That's Daniel 7, 13. Uh, in, the, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like the Son of Man. And so the Son of Man comes, and everything is given to him. Everything is given to him. Dominion, power, strength, all of it. And his kingdom is not just a short time. He's not going to just reign like four years and then be done. No, he gets four more years, and then he gets four more years, and then he gets four more years, and he gets four more years, four more years to eternity. And Daniel's reaction to this sight it's not, I had God over and we had a conversation in my garage. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious and the visions in my head alarmed me. Which is code for, woe is me, Isaiah. Isaiah sees the same thing. Isaiah sees God on the throne with the angels in front of him and his reaction is not, you know, it's good that you finally realized how important of a person I was, that we could have this engagement and have this contact. No, no, Isaiah goes, woe to me, for I'm a man of unclean lips from a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of glory. Woe to me, I'm a sinner. Later on, Daniel gets sick. Because the idea that you're just going to come up to God and be like, oh, I love you, man. You want to come to an LSU game with me? Is it going to happen? Because God's God and you're not. And as long as you think of God in these terms, you are forever in trouble. Old German Lutherans don't kneel. Really? Don't like kneelers in our churches. Well, some Lutheran churches have it, not mine. Well, one day you will kneel before him. All of us will kneel before him. That was not a plug for kneelers in the pews. Do not run up to Jimmy afterwards and go, if that guy gets kneelers in the pews, I'm done. That's not, that was not the point. The point is, is the idea that you're somehow never going to kneel before God is just wrong. I want you to watch what happens with, um, with our friend John. Back to the gospel. 
Thanks for, thanks for Daniel 7, buddy. Super appreciative of, of, uh, of um, Stevens' work back there. He's on the fly, man. He's on the fly. He's running, those, running that computer. Thanks, buddy. Um, oh, I love my Mac. So, behold, he, is, he comes in the clouds of heaven, and every eye will see him. This is important. Later on, there's a lot of folks that take Jesus' return as an isolated moment that occurs that nobody spots. All right? Um, the whole Left Behind series is based on this. Where Jesus' return is sort of, he, he, he gets the holy people and leaves the, the, the icky people behind and everybody's like, what just happened? Like, like I'm having a conversation with uh, the Hunes. And all of a sudden, Barbie, who's one of the best people in the world, is gone. And Hune and I are standing there. And she's just gone. And nobody knows where she went. <laughs> Hune, who never misses a chance to get laughs, just said, she does that in Target all the time. Um, this is the idea of a rapture that nobody knows about. Have you heard this before? You've heard this before. Um, this is the false teaching that doesn't agree with Scripture. So very clearly here, when he comes in the clouds of heaven, you can't miss him. This is not a situation where, where, where I'm visiting the Hutchesons and Danny and I are drinking a beer and all of a sudden mom and dad are gone. And we're like, I guess we'll just watch the game now, you know? Um, uh, and we don't know where they went. And on the news thing, a third of the earth just disappeared. Okay. Well, okay. Um, let's just sort of take that, trans let, let, okay, let's, let's take that, that understanding of Revelation and see if it agrees with the rest of the book. And here, behold, he is coming with the clouds of heaven and some eyes will see him? No. Every eye will see him. Like, I told you that, that, that we're going to read Revelation, and we're going to read Revelation having finished the rest of the book, the rest of the Bible. And when Jesus talks about um, his return, he says, as lightning flashes from the east as seen in the west, so will the Son of Man be, so, so shall the Son of Man, his appearance be. Well, I don't know how that works where you could be seen everywhere, but I'm also not God. And so, he says that you see him everywhere. Go ahead. Flat earth. Flat earth. <laughs> flat earthers. Whew. There are flat earthers. It's making a comeback. I made a side joke on a video short uh, about flat earth, and a thousand flat earthers on YouTube invaded, uh, invaded me, and they were, and they were, and they were letting me have it for, sort of for being a false teacher. And I was like, all of this business of flat earth, but you're not talking about Jesus at all. Um, if you're, unless you're talking about Jesus, then um, you're probably wrong. Because what is Revelation all about? It's all about, it's whose revelation? It's Jesus' revelation. All right, so, every eye will see him. Not some of the eyes, every eye. So if you have an interpretation of Revelation that has the return of Christ that doesn't have every eye seeing him, you don't have the right interpretation of Jesus' uh, of Jesus's revelation. And do you know who else sees him? Even those who pierced him. They're not alive anymore. Go ahead. Was that your question? Well, I was going to say, that sounds like the resurrection language. Right. Right, right. Uh, first off, if you are a Christian in the early church and Domitian is persecuting you, is it a comfort to you that Jesus is the faithful witness who is coming in the clouds of heaven and everybody's going to see him, even those who persecute him? Is that going to be a comfort to you? Yeah. Look, if we can be uplifted in a bad day by somebody sending us a text with an emoji on it, 
You know, I mean, imagine if God showed up to fix everything. You'd be incredibly uplifted. And also, concerning all the destruction that is going, about to go on in Revelation, um, oh, that's going to get me in so much trouble. All right, so um, you are the Israelites on the shore, and the Egyptians are pursuing you. You know what I'm, I'm talking about now? You have a wall on your right and a wall on your left, and behind you, a pillar of fire, a pillar of smoke. I don't know what's in front and what's in back. I always forget and have to rely on Jimmy to remind me. But, um, or, no, Terry to remind me. What's in front? Oh, right, day or night, right. So, so you're going through the Red Sea. Behind you, the Egyptians are like, yeah, yeah, they're on their chariots, and they're pushing, and they're catching, and they're gaining up on, they're gaining on you. And you get to the shore, you turn around, and then God washes them away in the waters. What were they going to do to you? They were going to kill you. And he has saved you. He has rescued you. And when you start to sing the song on the, sea, on the shore of the Jordan, great is the Lord and most worthy to be praised. Um, what is this thing? The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. If someone stops you and goes, don't Egyptian lives matter? You would be like, well, Israelite lives matter too. When God rescues you from the devil, you rejoice in that. On the last day, when you're standing before God and you're like, man, you got there just at the nick of time to rescue me from certain death. But I have a problem because the other two-thirds of the, unit, the world died. Don't their lives matter? His response is going to be, well, I gave them the same gospel that I gave you, and they were about to kill you. Would you like me to put you back there so they can finish you off? Now that I've been very offensive and probably will be um, canceled. Um, because to God, every life matters. Every color of life matters. Every person matters. And how do you know that? Amen. He died for all of them. He didn't just die for good people. Sandra I've died for, but Joel, meh. By the way, <laughs> sidebar joke, um, our, 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 our dear Christian brother Joe is responsible for beanie weenies being in the sermon because um, uh, uh, Joe was sitting at lunch with me yesterday. He was baptized at this font. His, he and his wife were married here. They live in Dallas and they come to church as often as they can. Okay, here. All right. So he's sitting at dinner and he goes, sermon thing can't be that hard. I mean, it's not like you have to do anything like complicated. It's the same thing every week, isn't it? You can recycle those, can't you? And he's like, you know what would be a real good challenge? Um, I'll put 20 extra dollars on the offering plate if you could get beanie weenies in a sermon. And I didn't even hesitate. Challenge accepted, buddy. <laughs> so if, if you were like the O'Neills whose head popped up was like, did he just say ramen noodles and beanie weenies? Understood that was for the good of our congregation. There's $20 extra in the plate because I accepted his challenge. Got it in the first paragraph, and I looked at him too. I was like, beanie weenies. Uh, if you can't, and if you're offended by that, then please understand that I, this was lighthearted and funny if it was uh, something crude and not baked beans mixed with hot dogs I would have never done it. But you have to understand that, be lighthearted, that joy is the second fruit of the Spirit, which means it's okay to be happy. That's the problem with what's going on in our culture now. There is no humor. Everyone is so angry that they've lost their humor. So, so um, I think somebody made a tweet about, it was not a proper tweet, but they made a tweet about earthworms and how earthworms were the most boring of creatures, they asked a scientist, what's the most boring creatures? Well, earthworms. They eat, they sleep, they poop, they reproduce. Except he was a little bit more sort of icky about that. 
word that he used for reproduce, and the internet came down on him for being hateful. You know what I mean? So if, if, if that was offensive, please forgive me, but uh, I would only ask that you understand that um, the Lord uh, is, the, the Lord has a sense of humor too. All you have to do is look at the duck-billed platypus or your, or your own children or just rewind to when your parents were like, I hope you get kids just like you. And then you're standing there looking at your kids like, they're just like me. <laughs> you could see his humor in all of creation. Now, this is not a laughing matter, his return. Except you will be filled with joy. But you know that he is for all because he died for all. And which means hating on people based upon something about them is icky. So we should agree with that. We should be like, yes, um, these lives matter. Now, we'll have to be more clear on that because um, certain things are s deliberately vague and we have a problem with sort of understanding them, but that would get a little bit political and that's not for here. But um, we should be like, lives matter. Lives matter. Lives matter, including little babies in the womb. But, oh, that's a different story. But lives matter. Lives matter. Including Christians being persecuted throughout the world. Lives matter. Lives matter. We should be like that. Anyway, sorry about that. Um, he is coming in the clouds. Every eye shall see him, even those who pierced him. Which means there's a resurrection. Person on a plane. You believe that you're going to come back from the dead? I believe you're going to come back from the dead too. Really? I don't believe in your God. Well, it's not going to go the same for you as it's going to go for me, but um, <laughs> I believe that you're coming back from the dead too. Everybody's coming back from the dead. It's whether they're coming back to life or death. I'll say it again. If you are looking for people to go to hell, you're in the wrong religion. If your main concern is making sure that people are damned, um, you're in the wrong religion. Lutheran's view of, view of hell is, is, uh, is Jesus' view of hell. It's there. We don't like it. Um, we don't want people to go there. Please don't go there. Um, we, we confess it's there, but it wasn't made for you. But if you work and try and, and reject God, you'll certainly go there. But no one need to. No one need go there. Well, I don't like a God that sends people to hell. I don't like that either. That's why he sent his son. He doesn't like that either. That's why he sent his son. So when the Calvinists say it's to the glory of God that he damned sinners, we're like, ah! that's not his shining achievement. When you ask God, what are you most proud of? My son, he died for all. What about sending people to hell? That's pretty low on my list of things that I'm happy about. All the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. The even so there is sort of like, okay. Now, if you're suffering and God is telling you <clears throat> that, uh, that, that, that's not the corona, I'm just clearing my throat. God is telling you, look, <clears throat> everyone who is persecuting you will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and I'll handle them. That's a comfort for you. That's a peaceful thing for you. And so all the nations will wail on account of him. Amen. You had a question? Comment? I thought you raised your hand. Okay. I love this next verse. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who was and is, who is and was and is to come, the Almighty. Oh, I love this verse. It's one of my favorites. What does it mean that he's the Alpha and the Omega? 
Alpha and omegas are everywhere. They're usually, they're, they're, well, they're on the pyramids normally. Where are they? Oh, there's one up there. There's an alpha and there's an omega right under the arms of the cross. There's an A and there's a horseshoe. If you're, you're like, oh, I like this church. They like horseshoes. It's right on their stained glass. No, that's, that's not what's going on there. Um, uh, the A is the first letter of the Greek alphabet, and the omega is the last letter of the... Uh, 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 um, Greek has two O's, omicron and omega. Omicron is the little O, literally, omicron, micro O. And the omega is the big O. You always want to be a big O, not a little O. You know what I mean? But Jesus is the alpha and the omega. You know, you know uh, Jimmy, instead of calling you JC the lesser, we could call you the little O. Because he's the alpha and the omega. So he's the alpha and the omega. He's the A and the Z. He's the beginning and the end. What happened before the Big Bang? Well, there's the Alpha and the Omega. He is, he was, and he is to come. How does he all of those things? He's God. You got it. So that's what the Alpha and Omega confesses. It's his, his eternalness. That isn't even a word. But his eternalness, he, who is and was and is to come, could give you an idea of heaven. If you are like me when I was little and I was trying to ask my grandmother about heaven, and I was dragged to mass, dragged to mass every Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon. Um, I remember it was Sacred Heart in. Um, we would go to Sacred Heart on Saturdays, and if we missed Saturday service, we would go to the cathedral on Sunday mornings, but um, so this, this, this has this dome, this, the Sacred Heart has this dome with this um, Jesus on, uh, they have beautiful artwork in Roman churches, um, with this heart, it was a Sacred Heart, um, beautiful, beautiful artwork, but I, I, I would sit, and I one time made the mistake of asking Grandma, what's heaven like? She says, it's, it's, it's mass all the time. And I was like, that's it? <laughs> you could see why college students fall away. Because I, I was ahead of the game and fell away in high school. That's it? That's it. No winning at the casino? No watching the, the Packers win the championship? Not, not this is finally Louisiana's tech, tech's year? None of that? Not, none of that? Just a church service the whole time? That sounds fun. <laughs> um, but it's not like that because time is different in heaven. And if you allow me just, um, just a second to sort of give you the, just a, a, a sort of a thought of this. Okay, God sits out of time, outside of time where everything is and it was and it is to come, all is happening at the same time. Time is not linear in heaven. Everything already happened, it is happening, and it will happen. Because it's eternity where time doesn't matter anymore. You have hints of this in, in science when they talk about how time is sort of warped by gravity at black holes it begins to sort of slow to nothing. Or, as you approach light speed. So you have hints of this sort of talk, but, so with God, everything is, and it was, and it is to come. It, it already, it, it, is, it is happening, it happened, and it will happen. And he sits outside of it all. And so sometimes you can look at prophecy as not, um, okay, so there has to be a Judas to die, to, to betray the Lord. And so God has this lottery and, and the Iscariots lose. And they're like, drat! You know? Um, it's, don't think of it that way. Think that God sees everything. And he sees Judas. And he knows what Judas is going to do. 
And so he tells us in advance what Judas is going to do. You, you have this with 90% certainty with your children, a little bit. Where Have you ever seen a kid, your kid about to have a train wreck of a, of, a, of a disastrous outcome, and you try to point it out to them, you know, maybe staying up all night the night before your exams isn't a good idea. Playing a game and not actually studying. And then when they get the D on their report card and they're like, who did this happen? This teacher's awful. You can be like, except I kind of told you that it was a bad idea. You're using reason to an experience to guess the future. God's already seen the future. There it is. So it's not really like you're going to be like, like uh, in heaven where uh, Danny and I'll be sitting next to each other and Danny's turn around and goes, these hymns are a lot better than the ones you picked while we were there. <laughs> no. You're going to know everyone. You're going to know everything, that, that how much God loves you. And time isn't going to be an issue for you. All right? Which is why when you enter into this place, you should think to yourself that, that um, it's 11-11. It's palindrome time. But, but you should think to yourself that Time doesn't matter here. If you got, just understand that, that like, time doesn't matter here. What, what I mean by that is, is those two ways of looking at it. If you're looking at your clock during the service because you have so much to do, um, I just want you to remember that if somebody was listening to you talk and they looked at your, their clock, you'd be like, do you have someplace you need to go? And you might be offended. God is like, I asked for an hour, hour and a half of your life a week. And that's strapping you, putting you out? Is that really, is that really doing that? Is that? That's like wearing you out, huh? Well, that's tough, isn't it? Um, so says the pastor who only preaches eight minutes because he's of the stiff-necked people. But, but my, my, my point here is, is learn to live where time doesn't matter when it comes to God. If your devotion takes 20 minutes, it takes 20 minutes. If your devotion takes 30 minutes, it takes 30 minutes. If it takes five minutes, it's five minutes. Have that time with God and learn how heaven is where time isn't an issue. I am the beginning and the end. I'm the alpha and the omega, says the Lord God, which invokes the Old Testament. I'm the one who is, and it was, who is to come. I'm the Pantocrator. Which is something that um, I need Mark Stevens to look up because it's a pretty famous picture. Um, I'm going to send it to you, Mark, and you can, you can Google it for him. It's a pretty famous picture of Jesus, which is an old icon. I've shown it to you before, but with the screens and Mark Stevens working, um, we should be fine on it. But Pantocrator is a, is, a, is, a, is a title of Jesus, translated here, the Almighty. The all Pantocrator, powerful. So one like the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven, who stands before the Ancient of Days and is given everything, all glory, dominion, honor, and power. And what John is pointing this to, there's the Pontocrator, a bunch of different pictures. Notice all the different, different icons of the Pontocrator. Usually he has a law book in his hand and a peace sign. He's usually holding the, uh, the, uh, the, the scriptures. He's holding the law in one hand, and in the other hand, he, he's making the sign of peace. All right? But a lot of ancient iconography has Jesus as the Almighty. It's one of my least favorite pictures of him because it invokes all that power. And if you understand that God, when he shows up to your garage, is going to blow your garage up, then this God on the last day is a scary God. Does that make sense? Thank you. I, John. 
Oh, wait, let's make sure we've got this. I'm the beginning and the end, which means he's eternal. He identifies himself as the Lord God Almighty, which is the God of the Old Testament. He sits outside of time. So everything is already happening. It has happened, and it will happen. He sees it all. Um, and he is the Pontocrator. He is the all-powerful. Now, just because God is all-powerful isn't comfort. Um, I'm going to use my buddy Joe again, just because he's an extreme introvert and doesn't like to be referenced. He's dying inside right now. I'm never coming back to this church again. Uh, well, until the next time I come and visit him. But the, um, uh, it, if, if Joe, Joe is the best CPA I've ever met before in my life. But that doesn't help me at all that Joe's the best CPA of all time until Joe is my CPA. Does that make sense? So it doesn't help you that God is all-powerful. That's not gospel yet until God is all-powerful for you. Does that make sense? So it's not covering that God is almighty or was and is and is to come, that he is um, that he is the Alpha and Omega until he's your Alpha and Omega. Until he is he's your was and is and is to come. Until he's your Almighty. And then you can, you can do the thing where you look at the devil and go, my God is bigger than you. He's going to beat you up and steal your lunch money. And when you reel your ugly dragon head at me, I'm going to hide behind him. And I'm going to stick my head out behind Jesus and go, neener, 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 devil. Neener, 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 devil. Uh, Thor is like this sometimes where he, where he is. Um, we, had a moment with, we had a moment over there. Thor is not a nice dog, but, I, but he's my dog, and so I, I have to put up with him. So he was, we were over here, and there's some um, Dobermans that got out. We were walking, and they got out right before one of the hurricanes. And we are walking and he normally engages all dogs. If a dog comes to him, he's going to alpha them. Even though he weighs 20 pounds wet, he's going to alpha them. He's going to show them who's boss. But these two Dobermans, they'd gotten out, and they were just walking like dogs that are not on a leash, that are carefree. And Thor sees them and is like, we got to go. And I mocked him. What's going on, buddy? Don't you want to go see those dogs? And he's like, no, we got to go. And his little legs are moving around here. And he's pushing me. And I'm saying, no, you'll heal. And he's turning around. And he's looking at them. And he's looking at them. And we got over here underneath the porticus. That's what it's called, right? Whatever the, the thing is called. And I looked at the dogs. And I realized Thor was right. We weren't going to get inside in time. And he was, a, he was a puppy. He was in trouble. I was more worried about him than me. You know, I'm, 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 I'm going to be fine. God's my God. I'm going to be fine. So I'm like, you know what, Thor? I bet we can get into the car. And so we hopped into the car just in the nick of time. The dogs were on us right as we, I closed the door. And as soon as I closed the door, Thor turns around and says, like, woof, 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 because he was behind the glass. And he is letting them have it. And I'm like, where was this boldness before? Well, you can do the same thing with God. The maker of the universe is your God. You can stand behind him and look at the devil, the world, the pandemic, the sinful flesh, the riots, everything, and look at him and, and go, you, you know, you can do whatever you want. God's my God. He's going to protect me. Now, that attitude has to be followed with don't get yourself killed because that's what they had to tell the early church Christians. Please don't go and get yourself killed. But what faith to believe that no matter what else happens to you, Everything's going to be okay because of Jesus. Pontocrator is my Pontocrator. The Alpha and the Omega is my Alpha and Omega. The one who is and was is to come is my God. He's got my back. He's going to save me. I, John, your partner and fellow communicant is better than partner because partner sounds like Southern Holly partner. No. Um, I commune with you is what this means. Soon Koinonos. Koinonos is uh, communion. Sun is together. And so 
I'm your together communicant, which means we commune together. So I'm your brother and your, your, your communicant in tribulation and the kingdom and the hupomene, that's, um, that word means uh, your remaining above, your steadfastness, your patience. The patient endurance that, that are in Jesus. So you don't want patience. The joke about praying for patience and then God will give it to you. What you want is patience in Jesus. Please don't forget to add in Jesus to your need for patience because the in Jesus patience is the only patience that holds, for sure. Your other patience will only last as long as people are allowing you to be nice to them. When they're stupid idiots, you will be impatient with them and give them what they deserve. But the, the patience which actually endures is the patience of Christ. was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the, and the, and the martyrdom of Jesus, um, the witness of Jesus. So where is John? Where's John? He's on Patmos. Do you have that map? Can you zoom in a little bit? Okay, that'll work. And that's unseeable. That's great. All right, so that little island, this little thing that you're looking at is Turkey. Now you got it? Mmm, Thanksgiving dinner. No, Turkey, the peninsula. And you'll see Patmos. And there you'll see Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Theatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. They're all very packed together. Their arrangement is random. If anyone says to you, and it forms some sort of sign which shows us, yeah, whatever. But what is important is there's Patmos and there's the churches in Asia, the seven parishes that he's about to make reference to. Does that help you now? And this is the coast of modern-day Turkey. Or what did you say, Barbie? Where was it? All right, an island in the Aegean Sea off the coast of a the ancient province of Asia, modern Turkey. See map on page 2197, correct? Right, which he has put above our heads. There you go, all right. So John is in Patmos, he's in exile, and he's in exile on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So he's not there just vacationing. Ah, oh, Patmos is a glorious place. You should try it in the winter. Um, no, he's not there for that. He's there because of the gospel. The gospel forced him to be there. I forget how long he's there, but um, he was under imperial um, exile. And he's there on account of the word of God and the witness and testimony of Jesus, which I believe is the suffering and death of Jesus. Verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Now, a lot of ink has been spilled on this, but there is a churchy way of looking at this. The charismatics always look at this as like he was speaking in tongues on the Lord's day. Um, I, don't, I just don't think that is what is really going on here. First, it's the Curia of Ake day. Literally, the day of the Lord. What is the Lord's day? First of all, you're right. But all days are his days, um, says Terry. But um, uh, the first day of the week. The first day of the week. So, I'm going to 
I think a lot of the interpretation of what happened here is because we've detached ourselves from what happens in this room. And that's how you end up with some strange, strange things as the interpretation of this verse. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Well, what happens in this room on the Lord's day? Worship. The Spirit does work. The Spirit does work on this day. And if you detach yourself from the church and where these scriptures are read, that's when you end up with, I was speaking in tongues on a Sunday afternoon. When if you just think this through, the way they would have thought this through in the first and second century, you could figure out what was happening. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Or if you're using the new one, right back at you, buddy, and also with you. But the Lord be with you and with your spirit. So what I think, and I, what I will, I will go all in on this. Uh, all my beanie weenie monies that are in the offering plate go in on this. Um, that, by the way, he put that in the offering plate. He didn't give the 20 to me. Thanks, buddy. Um, I think you should picture St. John in front of the altar on the Lord's Day praying. And if you're like, well, they didn't have altars back then. Okay, in front of a table, in a cave or a house, and he's praying. And the congregation, his little sheep are around him. And this happens during the service. And the reason, and there's proof of this interpretation too, because in later on in Revelation, we're going to bounce back and forth between the service going on in heaven and the stuff that's going on in earth. It, it is the wildest, wildest ride. It's, it's like, it's like in, the, in, the, in the coming chapters, at one point we'll have a whole chapter of what's going on in heaven. And then we'll cut to things blowing up on the earth. And then we'll go back to, and back to heaven, where everything is peaceful and calm and everybody's worshiping. You know, if that is a good chunk of revelation moving back and forth between the service that's going on in heaven, the liturgical service in heaven, and the craziness going on on earth, that the whole thing starts with the service going on in church. Don't forget also what you hear every Sunday up here. That um, And so we pray with angels and archangels and who laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising you and saying. Which is a hint that what's going on up here is not just pastor chanting off key. It's, it's us joined with everything, every service of all time, all going on throughout history in heaven and on earth. Well, how is that possible, considering we're stuck in time? Well, the heavenly service isn't stuck in time. It's going on at all times and in all places, throughout all of history, all what seems to be the same time. That would hurt your brain if you think about it too much. But I want you to think that way, that what goes on on Sunday morning isn't just a localized thing. You are praying with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven who laud and magnify his glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, when you commune at this table, you're not just eating, you know, thing that seems like bread, um, that tastes like cardboard, and thing that tastes like hot, hardcore 6% Jewish wine. Is that 20, is it, is it 9% alcohol in that wine? It's bad. Um... That's not what's going on. You are communing with everyone who has ever communed past, present, and future. You are communing with your grandparents, your grandchildren. You're communing with your, um, your great, great, great. Um, you're communing with, I'm communing with my cousin who fought for the 
the, the north, and I'm also communing with my cousin who fell in love with a southern girl and fought for the south. I'm, I'm communing with the boar carts that came over and um, uh, settled in Missouri, and the Landrys and the, um, that uh, settled in South Louisiana. You're communing with John and Peter and all of them. It's not just a localized thing. And Jesus. Think about that the next time you think to yourself, I don't want to stand next to that person at communion. Better repent of that. Because if you can't stand that person here on earth and you think that you're going to spend your eternity around them, that sort of attitude lands you in a place where you spend um, your eternity in the loneliest bayou in the south by yourself in hell. Crime in Italy, that can't possibly be done. Let's do another verse. I was in the Lord's day on the Spirit, and I heard before me a loud trumpet, a, a voice that sounded like a loud trumpet. Okay. We've already picked up a little bit of symbolism. We had... Um, we had the seven spirits of the churches being the Holy Spirit. Folks that tell you, I like to read Revelation as every word is um, interpreted literally. So does this voice sound like, Mah. well, no, it's a metaphor. Oh, Really? So you allow for some metaphor in the book of Revelation. Well, yes, because it has like or as in front of it. Well, if you can allow some metaphor here, um, simile, is that simile that has like or as? Simile has like or as, but both are metaphors. Thank you. Homeschooling to the rescue. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard something that sounded like the voice of a trumpet. What you need to take from the voice that sounded like the voice of a trumpet is what about this voice? It was loud. Boar carts are loud. We don't do anything quietly. God, help our neighbors. And this is louder than me. Not possible, but true. Write what you see in a book. That's handy. We have that book. And send it to the seven churches. To Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Theatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Seven churches. Random number. Just seven. Just a random number. Seven. Do you believe that? Seven is a God number. So what you should do when you hear these things is you should, do, you should, you should hear this. This is written to the church in its entirety, to God's church. So what you're going to look at for next week, and I promise you, things are going to start rolling faster. The introductory stuff is slow. We're going to get through more than just three verses next week. But what you should look, when you read the, what you should do is you should skim read the next two chapters. And what I want you to do for homework is because when we start getting through the churches, we're going to start flying. But I want you to listen for what happens in different churches that you may have experienced. Because the seven churches are reflected of churches in the past, and they're reflected of churches in the present. And everyone takes this this way, even those who take this literally. But if this could be secular, 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 Cyclical, there it is. Thanks, O'Neill. She's like, you can do it. You can do it. If this can be cyclical, if this could apply to every church, if we should look at this and do a diagnostic of our church to find out what's going on and which of these churches we are. And we are in the year of our Lord, 2020 AD, and every other church throughout time has done the same thing, that might give us a clue on how to read Revelation as a whole that these things might have happened, they might will happen, and they might happen again.
But now we're getting, into, we're getting out of the introductory stuff, and we're going to start flying soon. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen.